Szanowni Panie. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are glad to welcome you here at the second Ukrainian Women's Congress, and we ask to the welcoming word Olena Kondratyuk, the Member of Parliament of Ukraine. A little bit of applause, don't be shy, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, honorable guests, to all the optimists and enthusiasts who had the time to visit us here. We are a little bit worried and thrilled. You see that today's day is extraordinary today. We work for two days and the first day is extremely important because as you see, we have the frames, we have honorable guests today and let's give everybody the round of applause. And today we are responsible and we responsibly welcome everybody who is going to participate in our Congress. And let me, on behalf of the organizers and initiators of the COHOS Equal Opportunities, and our heads, me, Olena Kondratyuk, Maria Leonova, Svetlana Wojciechowska, Olena Babak, to welcome you here at the opening of the second International Ukrainian Women's Congress. Let us begin and we say one more time, we are together and we are strong. Let's start our work. Thank you, Ms. Olena Kondratyuk. And we start the first discussion platform, Ukrainian and global trends with regard to the equal rights and opportunities for men and women. And let me welcome to the word the moderators of the first discussion platform, Ms. Olena Kondratyuk. We always would like to invite the speakers for the discussion platform. Irina Herashenko, first deputy speaker of the Parliament of Ukraine, President's Commissioner for Peaceful Situation Resolution in Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Hennady Zubko, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Minister of the Regional Development, Construction, Housing and Communal Services of Ukraine. Rasa Yuklevichine, Vice President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Mirel Klapot, a French Member of Parliament, Vice President for the Foreign Affairs Commission. Anna Maria Koratsa Bild, Member of the European Parliament, EEP Group, active in the Committee of Women's Rights and Gender Equality. The delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee, the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection, and the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Lilia Hrenevich, Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine. Karolina Leokovic, Acting Leader of the CPD Croatia Women's Forum, Vice President of PES Women. Laura Cooper, United States Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia. Attention please on the screen. The difference in men and women uh, capabilities is decreasing, which is proved by the World International Forum that calculates the index of gender equality in terms of four criteria, politician involvement, health, education and economic activity and opportunities. In terms of education, we almost fought the difference. In healthcare, there is no difference, but still we have uh, women which are poorer and receive lower salary and less career opportunities. The biggest inequality is in politician, because when we speak about women ministers, members of parliament, there are not enough of them. And uh, no country in the world could have reached total e equality in gender. We can speak about uh, successful countries with the low life quality, but there is no successful country with gender equality. Economic research leads to growing GPD when women are involved. Ukraine managed to improve its position in eight points and took 65th, 61st position. 
the situation with gender inequality is actually uh, better than in the world average. Uh, women are still playing an important role in economics. There are more women in education establishments. The health and the life duration in women is bigger, but the involvement of policy is a kind of catastrophically low. So how to involve women into policy and economics to improve the socioeconomic conditions in Ukraine? Uh, dear friends, uh, we start our first panel discussion. You have watched the video, and I think everybody understands and everybody knows the issues that exist in Ukraine. Uh, you've seen that basically in terms of index of equality between men and women in Ukraine, Ukraine is not taking the worst position, but still we see that uh, this index is uh, relatively small when we talk about politics, and I would like to give the word to Irina Herashenko, first Deputy Speaker of the Parliament of Ukraine, and President's Commissioner for Peaceful Situation Resolution in Donetsk and Luhansk region. And the question, I think, is a little bit rhetorical, but still, uh, taking into account the name of our panel, is there a gender mainstream in Verkhovna Rada and what's its features? And we actually know that in this parliament we have the most qu quantity of women during its history. Is it reflected somehow in the parliament's work? Are there any changes to it? And which changes can we expect in the nearest future? Because we do understand we have a great law uh, about quotas. Uh, from the political parties, and I would like to hear f uh, a couple of words from you, Ms. Irina. Thank you very much, Ms. Olena, and I would like to start my word with expressing gratitude for the equal opportunities to Ms. Olena, Ms. Maria, who is, despite the fact that she is supposed to be in another uh, room now because she is all the time together with us and she helps us to hold this congress Ms. Svetlana and Ms. Olena because they are a kind of engines not only of today's very important event but also of, of all many important things which are happening now in the parliament in terms of the protection of rights of women and gender equality. You know in our parliament there are a lot of 100 different political entities but some committees are not actually working and your caucus equal rights is one of the most active. Really, in our parliament, we have only 49 women, and nobody believes in it. It's neither society nor our partners. They think that the Ukrainian women, it's like 50%. That's why, because our Ukrainian mm, women in parliament are very active. And what we've managed to achieve, thanks to uh, caucus uh, equal opportunities, it's not only the presence of women. It is also the influence of women for the decision taking, uh, not only to, I don't know, decorate, to make a kind of decoration, but also to influence the making of political decisions. And it's very important that today we have women both in committees. They take uh, the leading posts. For example, our dear Ms. Maria Ionova, she's the leader of Committee of Euro Integration, one of the key Ukrainian committees for the parliament, because we have proclaimed that our goal is the uh, Euro Atlantic integration. And now uh, we are happy because in government we also have more women uh, who are ministries, and we are very glad to welcome here our. Uh, of Lila Hranevich and all women who actually were the members of the caucus uh, equal opportunities, they started uh, being the government members. This includes uh, Pani Ivana Klimpushtensade, who is the deputy minister for every integration. This is the case with Irina Fris, who is the minister in veteran cases. Actually, it's also the case even with Petro Poroshenko, who now is the president of Ukraine. And you do understand that he is very selective in terms of uh, which caucus should he enter. And the only answer that he actually did, it was equal uh, <laughs> opportunities. 
probably Hennady Zubko can also be mentioned because who could have been the deputy minister for the regional development and decentralization if he wouldn't be selected by our parliamentary caucus. And I would like to say from the very beginning, so all of the sexists in Iran, they are not the members of our equal opportunities. So just ignore them, yeah, because we know everything about them. Please, I would like to uh, talk about very serious topic, yeah, uh, and talk a little bit about serious things. And I would like to say that, of course, our task is not to increase in the number of women in politics. There is no exclusion, and we have to have a lot of influence uh, in different spheres and different sectors. And we are fighting the sexist stereotypes and uh, in the spheres which used to be very conservative towards women, especially we speak about uh, the military forces and the security service forces and the biggest uh, success of this session. That's why we managed to adopt the law and we welcome, by the way, the embassies in this room. And of course, one of the most conservative is still the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, despite the fact that most of the women are taking the medium management, we have only a few women who are ambassadors to very important countries such as Great Britain, Hungary, but this is not enough, so we have to fight this stereotype as well. And talking about security services, we've managed to adopt the law which fights the Soviet stereotype that women can take the leading position like military officers and we see now that we have the first woman who is general of medical service but still step by step we are supposed to fight the stereotypes and then to uh, take very nice positions uh, to serving uh, the Ukrainian nation in the army. And even today, according to my data, uh, 25,000 of women, 25,300 women are serving in the military forces of Ukraine. And only 30, uh, th 300 of them is basically the officers. And it doesn't reflect the Ukrainian uh, women's contribution to the peacemaking process. And this law, uh, with this parliament, first of all, we are fighting the stereotypes in the security and military forces. I think that Ukraine, actually not till the very end, uh, takes the uh, world trend of the uh, involving women into peacemaking pro processes. Four years ago, when President Poroshenko adopted me as the uh, Commissioner for Peaceful Situation Resolutions. I've heard a lot of things that I am not from Donbass, I am not a diplomat, because uh, I don't have to be born in Donbass uh, to uh, go there and to uh, help people there. And in this list of laws which were adopted with my co-authorship, of course, yesterday, for example, we adopted two laws. This is the humani humanitarian uh, sector of laws, and it takes a lot of activity and a lot of understanding for the humanitarian risks. And you know that women can do it uh, in a larger scale. Very interesting statistics I would like to give you today. You know that uh, we are very actively studying and observing the experience of the countries who passed away of different conflicts. It's a little bit different because it, they were eternal conflicts, but not the aggression. But for example, the experience of Colombia, when women were involved into the peacemaking processes, at the very beginning of negotiations between the government and the uh, uh, the Gileras and FARC, uh, only one woman was involved, was at the, actually at the table at the negotiations. But in two years, among the negotiators, we had 20% of women. And in terms of Gileras, the number of women, it was 43%. 
And as, a kind, as witnesses say, the success of these negotiations is the best proof that women started this dialogue about the humanitarian aspects. And when the humanitarian questions are solved, then there is a push for solving the political block of questions and security issues. And as a negotiator in Minsk, I would like to attract your attention that in Russian group there isn't any women. And this is a kind of indicator as well. There are representatives of security services, former government officials, but there isn't a woman in this delegation. And probably this is, this is why it is so hard to discuss uh, the humanitarian topics. And if to talk about the uh, guerrilla, uh, who are not the participants of Minsk group, but they are invited, you know that uh, regardless of the uh, gender, they are just the full puppets of the Kremlin. And I welcome very much all of these opportunities for women who are peacemakers. Uh, and my colleagues as well, who are very actively involved in this uh, process of humanitarian question solutions. And we welcome that the parliamentary also chosen uh, Ms. Denisova as an ombudsman. And I would also like to express my gratitude to the mothers and the wives of those people who are now imprisoned and who are lost without trace. They, let's give them just the round of applause and moral support for the families of Ukrainian seamen who are together with the whole world are fighting for setting them free. And finally, just a, a couple of horrible uh, numbers, I think, because the women are the biggest victims to this war. Uh, the Ukrainian is paying very high price for uh, the U Russian aggression uh, against our, our country. The war interferes into the private life of Ukrainian women, and 1,500 women are widows. 2,000 of children are losing their fathers, and uh, wives are losing their husbands. This is the price that Ukrainian women pay for protecting our motherland. And it is obvious that the society is supposed to take this into consideration. The women's role in terms of their territorial and so integrity and sovereign protection and to give more attention and respect and more chances. And we are fighting for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Irina. And she actually touched the questions connected with the security. And we will go back to some additional questions for political involvement a little bit later. There are separate issues. And now I would like to give the word to uh, Ms. Laura Cooper, who is the United States Deputy Assistant Security for Defense for Russia. And it's very symbolical spoken by the word spoken by Irina. We would like to find out your ideas about what is the role for women playing in terms of the women's integrity and women's equality in such an important sphere because we do understand the fifth year of war and active military action and your words for support and support for the United States is extremely important and we would like to understand the mechanism how the women can be involved to the security. Thank you. much. It really is an honor to be here addressing this group on this important topic. And I have to say, I find myself very inspired to be with such a dynamic and impressive uh, group of women. I've had the pleasure to welcome some of you to my office in the Pentagon, uh, and it's just great to be here with you. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, though. I almost never talk about the topic of women and security because I believe firmly that national security is a woman's issue. For much of my career, it's absolutely true that I've been the only woman in the room quite frequently, um, but I've chosen not to focus on this fact. Instead, I've focused on the job at hand, which is bolstering US and international security and defense. There are times when I have reflected on the role of women in security, 
Um, for example, I look back, uh, I used to work on Afghanistan policy for many years. And the moment that I met that first class of Afghan national police recruits who were women, I, it, it just brought me chills. And I thought at the time about how that really was a moment in the history of women. And that moment was one where you could see these individual brave women, very young women, I must say, shaping the course of their country's future. But today, I really would like to challenge you to think about what issues can you tackle, not because of or despite being a woman, but simply because these issues are just so important. For me, here in Ukraine, obviously one of the most pressing issues is how to deal with the threat from Russia. As we all know, this challenge came into sharper focus after Russia attacked Ukraine's vessels and captured the crew members and the ships, as we just discussed, on November 25th. So today I want to talk about that. Today I want to reiterate to you and to the people of Ukraine America's steadfast support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia occupies Crimea and fuels conflict in the Donbas in its attempt to change borders by force and to thwart our goal of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. We must not accept this aggression as a fait accompli. Russia's aggression is not simply a matter for Ukraine. It's a threat to the region, to Europe, to the United States, and to the stability of the international order. The aggression of Putin's Russia should not simply be viewed in the context of its occupation of Ukraine or of Georgia. Remember, Russia has also provided years of support for the Assad regime's crimes against humanity, enabling the regime's use of chemical weapons on its own people. Russia conducted the first known offensive use of nerve agent on the territory of one of our NATO allies, the UK, first time since the founding of the alliance. And daily, Russia uses propaganda and disinformation to undermine governments across the world. These are examples that expose a long pattern of Russian activities that threaten international peace and stability. We must not accept Russia's manipulation of the conflict in eastern Ukraine, nor its occupation and attempted annexation of Crimea. In July, the United States formalized a policy that rejects the Kremlin's purported annexation of Crimea by releasing the United States Crimea Declaration. There will be no relief of Crimea-related sanctions until Russia returns control of the peninsula to Ukraine. In the maritime domain, the United States condemned Russian aggression in the Black Sea. This was an attack on Ukrainian vessels as they attempted to transit through the Kerch Strait. As you all know, this was Russian vessels ramming a Ukrainian vessel and then opening fire, injuring Ukrainian crew and then seizing the crew members and the three vessels. This represents a dangerous escalation and a violation of international law. We call on Russia to return to Ukraine its vessels and its detained crew members, and to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, extending to its territorial waters. The United States also condemns Russia's harassment of international shipping in the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. Russia has delayed hundreds of commercial ships transiting Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov. Russia's actions to impede maritime transit are further examples of the ongoing campaign to undermine and destabilize Ukraine and Russia's disregard for international norms. I want to be clear that the United States will remain committed to building the capacity of Ukraine's military to include its naval forces. The United States recently agreed to transfer to Ukraine two island-class patrol boats. This is the latest example of America's long-standing effort to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
Since 2014, the United States has, com has committed more than $1.1 billion in security assistance to build the defensive capabilities of Ukraine's forces and to enhance interoperability with NATO. Going forward, the U.S. intends to continue providing security assistance support to Ukraine across all domains, including maritime, by providing equipment to support its most critical operational needs. The United States also maintains a robust advisory effort to advance critical defense reforms. These reforms will help, help make Ukraine's defense enterprise more effective and more efficient. This effort includes helping Ukraine rebuild its Navy in line with Ukraine's recently released naval strategy. The adoption of this naval strategy is in line with NATO standards and concepts and represents a strategic decision and a commitment to integrate with Euro-Atlantic institutions and to protect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Ukraine has made significant strides on defense reform, including the recently adopted Law on National Security, which provides a legislative framework for aligning Ukraine's national security architecture with Euro-Atlantic principles. This constitutes a major step toward Ukraine's goal of achieving NATO interoperability. Ukraine must continue to build on this progress by swiftly implementing key provisions of the law to ensure that Ukraine's defense and security sectors embody Euro-Atlantic principles. The implementation of these reforms will bolster Ukraine's ability to defend its territorial, territorial integrity in support of a secure and a thriving democratic Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, today I focused on Russia's aggression in the maritime space because this is a challenge that's facing all of us, men and women. Security is a woman's issue. In order to overcome this and any other challenge, both men and women need to put their minds together and develop the best path forward. Excluding women means only tapping into 50% of the population's brain power to solve what are really our most urgent issues. The United States remains committed to continuing our political, economic, and military cooperation in support of an even stronger and more enduring strategic partnership between our two great nations. The United States, and speaking for myself personally, look forward to continue working with Ukraine, including these very impressive women in Ukraine's national security community and in other fields. We will work on these national security challenges together. Thank you so much. Дуже дякуємо пані Купер за таку надихаючу промову. Я вам скажу, що Thank you, Mrs. Cooper, for this so inspiring speech. So, well, I would like to say that it was uh, absolutely um, clear accent so we've uh, heard from you. So thank you so much for um, your presence here. So well, I know that you're so busy and you have to leave. You're going to have the flight so soon. So, But for us, it's uh, very important for your uh, visit at presence here. So well, thank you so much for your work. So well, and uh, let us move on. So well, we're going to speak the different issues. So we would like to give a floor to the main feminist who is in the government right now. So well, we know Mr. Henady Zubko, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Minister of Regional Development, Construction, Housing, and Communal Service of Ukraine. So well, could you report us, please, about your work, uh, which is extremely important you've done for us, especially your ministry. You've done a lot of work. So well, we're just looking uh, to hear from you on the issue of decentralization and the role of women in this process, or so leading role of the women in this uh, process. So what we're going to do just to increase the role of women. Thank you so much. Good afternoon again. So well, I cannot stop to stop to express my special thanks for and thanks to our international partners, especially for the uh, security function. So it's a very clear position. So we're really we wish 
we had this position last Monday, and then we want to have this act to, of uh, um, consolidation against Russian aggression to be a kind of a meaningful thing in our parliament. So we have to explain what type of conditions we have to hold for our reforming process. Uh, so, well, uh, we've got the SMS uh, from another leader that uh, Catherine is coming to Ukraine to support Ukrainian women. And then I got this SMS from her flight uh, from here. So well, I would like to say the letters uh, uh, not to uh, have it. So well, uh, um, I mean, the man, I mean. So, well, I'm just, you know, but uh, we've heard this uh, uh, absolutely specific uh, formula. The man uh, could not be so successful without uh, acceptance uh, the gender equality for women and men. So, we would like to say a few words about the directions of our work in our parliament. First of all, I would like to agree to, uh, with the self-governance uh, day to all of our uh, deputies, managers, etc. Those who are responsible for this very hard work, because when we say that's the possibility, responsibility, we're just talking about the responsibility, not about our life's responsibility, but the responsibility of the communities. And I would like to be honest and to say and to admit that I can see the inequality. And I said the majority in our whole are women. And two uh, days ago, we had the forum, the third form of region so well we had absolutely a uh, different situation we have the different pictures so about 10 percent of uh, women were at presence there but uh, the majority were men during that forum and uh, the uh, majority uh, were men so now i'd like to say a few words first of all the first strand uh, the um self-governance uh, that's a basis for future country so we're talking about the involvement of our managers uh, uh, deputies to the different self-governments, etc. So well, still, it's in the lowest level. It's about 14% of the involvement of women. But I do know that there are positive uh, samples from Khmelnytsky region, so well, 22%. Uh, percent. So now I would like to express thanks to Khmelnytsky region for this highest percentage. For another th uh, from another thing, we have only 8% of women in Odessa's uh, uh, council. So well, I know that the forum they just hold in Odessa, it was kind of a push for them to change the situation. Well, we see the uh, so-called uh, uh, changes in the self-governments. So well, I would like to say that uh, the, well, we have to understand that the manager, lady manager, uh, can uh, make everything possible. But I uh, would like to say the level, the highest level, the less women. So, well, uh, the upper level, 14s, and the local level authorities, 8s. And then, so we have to understand the executive bodies in the self governments. Uh, they are in majority there. So, they are doing the routine work, they are responsible for every. Uh, implementations of the projects and uh, other thing I would like to say to discuss uh, with uh, our deputies, uh, representatives of ministries, with managers, etc. So well, we also would like we have uh, uh, to say uh, ministers of finance, Oksana Makarova, you know, it's another ministry um, representative minister, minister of finance, for example, is very responsible um, position and it's very efficient things to use a lot of of uh, leadership, etc. So well, for us, the regional development, the gender-oriented projects, they absolutely linked to, to this type of activity. So well, in the our ministry, we've analyzed what's going on. And after the first Congress, there was absolutely great change after the first uh, uh, Congress. So well, we've uh, seen and uh, analyzed the projects. So our projects are gender-oriented. Uh, they are and they were blind uh, regarding the gender orientation. So well, I'm very thankful to our international partners because we're just dealing on the gender budgeting. And we started from ourselves. We started to implement the code of the equal possibility. That's a um, attestation, that's salaries, that's the hiring to the job process, etc. So well, that's the specific way to send the anonymous messages, uh, notes, etc. So that 
when we started to the expertise of the normative acts, uh, we're starting to deal with this. So we have four um, advisors, uh, ladies advisors, those who are working with us. So we're very thankful. So well, we do not have a lot of specialists in the legal issue to find out where and what we can uh, um, deal with this. So well, we're just you know dealing with the gender expertise and all normative uh, um, acts. And this is the first step. And we've done it because of the success of the first Women Congress. So well, and the very important step, the third step is that uh, we can see the two indexes uh, which must be work in Ukraine. And we have to uh, show to investors what's going on in Ukraine. So well, especially the index of the people's development and the competitors, uh, competition index. So well, just to see the impact of the gender uh, on inequality. So it's very important thing. So it's not so easy to find out how it works. So well, the inequality, that's the how the inequality impacts into the development processes. So well, that's the very ambitious uh, task for us to implement uh, the uh, process of index uh, inequality into the process of monitoring. So well, we have to deal with it. So well, let us greet it. It's very complicated things because the index of gender inequality, they was implemented only for the countries. And then we don't have the samples where we can use on the regional level. We so well, this is three steps we have to take into account. The reduction of health, the second is the expansion of the abilities of the women to be involved into the authorities' activities, and the third, gender products, projects. The gender projects which will uh, give the uh, possibilities to women. It's not human rights, but this is the very important issue for Ukraine to become a uh, developed country. So we'll, um, the last day was uh, some of job managers, they had the speech and they've been talking about women. So well, triple double means women, water, three W. Women, water, and 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 then the what wealth? The issue of wealth. Three W, the key issues. So, well, this is very important issue for regional development. Three main things to help Ukraine to become very well developed. So, well, water resources, we have to keep our women, we have to support them and to develop the abilities and wealth. This is the very important factor which will follow the above mentioned too. So I would like to express my thanks. Thank you for women members, uh, for the equal opportunities. And I would like to express special thanks to all women who are here in the hall, those who are supporting us for the first ministry who implemented this equality code, started to expertise with this issue. I would like to express thanks to our managers, uh, women deputies, those who took the responsibility for the very important things. So well, let's move on and let's not to stop. Move on. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we have such a wonderful, in, uh, very uh, um, inspiring uh, platform speeches. And I would like to uh, greet the extremely important guest, Vice President of the Parliament Assembly of NATO, uh, Miss uh, Vice President of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Mrs. Rasa Yuknavichina. And we understand that we are moving on a strategic uh, uh, as a country to the highest standards of NATO. And uh, today our country is in the process of adaptation period of time to the alliance. And I would like to ask a question to Rasa, to the uh, former uh, uh, vice, um, uh, 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 it's so members of uh, government. And I would like to find out what is the obstacles you face during this process, how uh, fast you've adopted uh, all that uh, ideas, etc. So dealing with NATO's and alliance, uh, could you please? Thank you so much. Slava Ukraini. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the brave Ukrainian soldiers uh, 
men and women who are protecting not their own country, but our freedom as well. <laughs> Democracy, freedom, love for homeland are independent of gender. I never thought that I am a different citizen because I am a woman. And um, I was lucky because I have never encountered an attitude that I am a woman, therefore different in politics. So answering your question, first of all, I would like to say that uh, this forum for me is primarily about the future of Ukraine, about the future of men and women of Ukraine. Uh, and, of course, it's, this forum is uh, not only about Ukraine, but about the future of Europe. I do not imagine democratic, secure Ukraine without EU and NATO membership. It will be not easy way. Maybe it will take time, a lot of time. I don't know when, but I don't see any other strategy for your country as well as it was in my country. I started in politics. At that time, it was no word even politics. It was fight for independence in 1990. And later, I recognized that without membership in NATO and EU, my country will not be stable and I don't know if uh, we will be able to keep our country as a statehood. So that's why in 1996, my choice was when I was re-elected to the Parliament, National Security and Defense Committee. And uh, despite I was medical doctor and uh, everybody expected me maybe to, to, to be part of uh, health affairs, but that was utmost important and we succeeded. Maybe at that time it was the last train uh, which went through our region and we were the last, uh, we catched the last wagon maybe of that train. But I am sure that the next train will come and it will depend on yourself first of all. Uh, why? Because you know, Yes, I will be frank and open. Not everyone in Western countries understands how important Ukraine is for Europe it, as well. But that is only a matter of time to change the mind. And you are getting more and more friends in European Union, in NATO. Uh, but uh, first of all, it's, it's your choice. And uh, answering, every time I am here in Ukraine, I am getting the question, when we will become members of NATO? My answer is, don't think about the time when you will become member of NATO. Think, are you ready to be part of NATO, to be members of NATO? And when the day X will come and you will be, or the situation will be that you, European Union, NATO, they will be ready to, to invite you, you will be ready. That's it. It will be no doubts that you are ready. So every reform, every step forward, not easy reforms, uh, it, 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 it costs patience and uh, a lot of concentration on, on everything, political, uh, political um, responsibility of all politicians, not only of those they are in government, but also of those they are in opposition as well. It's very important. What, when we started in 93, we made an agreement among political parties, former communists and opposition. We lost election in 92. I mean, those political uh, politicians, we restored independence and former communists came back to power. But we were able to agree 
on our main strategy of, of our country. And this is utmost important what are you doing now in your parliament to put in your uh, law system fundamental, most important fundamental laws on your Euro-Atlantic integration. To have your process not reversible, irreversible. And because you know, it's, uh, it's, it's your history that in 2010, your elected president came to Brussels and said, no, we don't need NATO. So in, in our countries, of course, people are looking to Ukraine that if, if, if it will be irreversible, not reversible process for NATO and EU. And this is what you are about. You, people, you are, you are here and growing up in occupied Lithuania, I would never have imagined that I would one day become a Minister of Defense of Independent Lithuania. That one day I will become the President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. But it happened. So, as a granddaughter of a victim of Stalin Gulag, I am proud to be with you and encourage all of us to do our best to contain aggressive dictatorships in, in Europe, aggressive Kremlin, and uh, what are you doing? It's for benefit for Russian people as well. Because success of Ukraine is possible, is maybe alternative for Russian people to have different country and to behave differently. It will not happen tomorrow. I don't know if I will have opportunity to see different Russia in my life. But this, is, is, this can be goal for all of us, to have different democratic Russia as well in the future. And you are very important part of this strategy to have different democratic Russia in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Yukhnovich. And I would like to uh, prove that we're just doing our maximum efforts just to be ready to um, join the alliance. And we understand all the challenges and all risks uh, connecting to this. And I would like to give a word to Mr. Mirek Klopert. Uh, that's a French member of parliament, vice president of the Foreign Affairs Commission. If she was chosen of the National Assembly of France, so we're just looking for a new Macron. And then in the year 2017, to the national meetings, uh, to the national, uh, it was a kind of a 40% uh, gave to France to jump over uh, from 64th place to the 17th place uh, of the women's parliaments. Uh, and then where they are six. In Europe, and they are ahead of Europe, ahead of uh, um, England and uh, um, German. What was the key reason for this type of success? Uh, maybe because of the leader of the party, uh, the leader of the party who lead the women, or do you have any mechanisms to encourage you? Or maybe you can uh, provide the three advices or secrets uh, on behalf of Macron on, on, on from directly from you. So how to make this 38 uh, at least percent in our parliament? Thank you in advance. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, uh, thank you for your invitation uh, too, because uh, I'm very proud uh, to to be here. Um, maybe a few information about myself. As you mentioned, I am a, a member of French Parliament. I was elected in June uh, 2017, but I had a former life. I, I was not always a, a member of Parliament. Um, I am an engineer, I worked in industries, and I was a counselor to a mayor, and then I was uh, in charge of partnerships with companies. And why was I, was I elected? I was elected because Emmanuel Macron, our president, imposed 50% of female candidates, and now we have a parliament with 38% of women. <laughs> Thank you. 
And as a member of parliament, I'm also vice president of the Commission of Foreign Affairs, and I am a member of the friendship group between France and Ukraine. And Valeria, my colleague, president of this group, will uh, tell you a few words uh, later. Uh, I am especially involved in human rights and in women's rights, but at an international level. And I wrote a report about this subject with 100 proposals for a feminist diplomacy. And remembering of my life, I think I have always been a feminist. So I fully support the feminist policy in France and the feminist diplomacy. Involvement of women in politics and in administration of the cities, of the local authorities, involvement in the national assemblies have to be encouraged and recognized. Very often, women think they don't have the capabilities. I say to them, yes, you can. Dare to be a candidate, dare to express your minds, dare to speak and to ask questions even when men laugh at you. I am now convinced that gender equality is not only a matter of rights, it is a matter of rights, but it is to a very efficient way to make the world change. A world with less violence, less poverty, more equity, more ecology, more development, and of course more security and peace. Let me give you a rapid insight about what we pointed out in our report. First of all, we should protect sexual and reproductive health and rights. I need to insist on this aspect because conservative countries try to move, to move back. United States in particular and a few European countries too are today against birth control, against contraception, against abortion. We propose to enhance education to sentimental life, to teach young boys and girls how the, how the babies are conceived, how their body is done. A lot of young girls, and moreover, a lot of young boys, have no idea of the relation between menstruations and pregnancy. And the capacity to have children when it is wanted is essential and it, uh, it has some secondary benefits on demography. Right to health, to education are to be protected specifically. The girls have to be helped to go to school. Families also need to be helped financially, of course, but culturally too. Therefore, France is especially involved in aid development toward African countries. 50% of the projects will be dedicated to gender equality. We consider it's our responsibility to help these little African girls to have access to education instead of being assigned to water providing and domestic tasks. And now I would like to say <clears throat> a few words about another field, it's digital transition on the gender tech gap. Dear young woman, dear women, don't stay away from the digital revolution. Enter the jobs, enter the careers. We should increase the proportion of women all over the world working in science, in digital world, in technical jobs. Because today, algorithms are designed by people who have an unconscious tendency, an unconscious bias, to see the world from a male point of view. And artificial intelligence shouldn't be dominated by men. <laughs> so part of my recommendations are linked to these problems. And I suggest to create schools, prizes, challenges, and to highlight some women one can identify herself to. To sum up, let's say that women have to be an active player in all the transitions of the world. The political transition, the ecological transition, the society transition, and the economical transition. Why is it important to have these words now publicly? Because the risk of regression I mentioned. And now I would like to conclude with a focus on multilateralism, which is part of our diplomacy. 
G7 is a unique opportunity to put light on gender equality in world governance. Everybody knows what G7 is, a group of uh, USA, Canada, Japan, UK, Germany, Italy, and France. And Emmanuel Macron, our president, will be the chairman of the G7 in 2019. The final summit will be held in Biarritz in France in June. The French G7 will be a feminist event, even more feminist than the previous uh, event that was under Canadian presidents. So values of gender equality should be included in the final declaration. And we, members of French Parliament, members of all the, these seven parliaments, will be active to promote these values. And furthermore, next year, France could say the opportunity to preside over the Council of Europe and to preside over the United Nations Security Council so that equality between men and women remains a priority. So as a conclusion, as you saw, and as Valeria will uh, develop maybe, France is very active in gender equality in domestic issues with President Macron and, President and Minister Schiappa. Gender equality is linked to public policy and has to be impulsed by us, by the politicians. But every progress you get has to be seen from a global point of view which improv improvement it provides to you, but also what gender equality provides to the world. Multilateralism is a good way to make progress, and France certainly has still a lot of progress to do, but France has also a special expertise to share. As a conclusion, dare to promote gender equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Clapeau, for these uh, tools you already offered how to reach the parity, and especially according with the global indexes of the global equality, especially in the fields of healthcare. So well, we will talk later on, but I would like to uh, move on to our very friendly country, Sweden, and uh, to give a floor to our follower and to our very good friend of Ukraine, Mrs. Anna Maria Grazabil, member of the European Parliament, EPP group. Let greet her. So you know that she's a very active and promoting Ukraine issue in the European Parliament, and so well she's the uh, uh, in the list of the sanctions of Russia from the side of Russia, so well, as well as Gerasimenko. So, so she's a representative of EU uh, in this list. So well, Miss uh, Anna Maria Graz. So for us, uh, uh, Sweden is the criteria of gender equality, economical uh, um, the top. To, um, achievements. So, well, we know the balance in the parliament of uh, Sweden. We know that too many women in your parliament. So, well, what is your recommendations or advices for us? What is the best way? Uh, what to reach the criteria? Is the best criteria, especially in the field of political activities? So, well, in reality, for us, it's very interesting. We just, you know, is it possible to provide the quoting process through the specific mechanisms? to provide the gender equality in the parliament just to get this index of political activity to reach to reach the highest level of this political activity. Thank you so much. Nice to be back here in Kiev and Ukraine. As a friend of Ukraine, really, with my heart, I've been coming here over the years, and I'm so impressed by the women I work with in the Joint Parliamentary Assembly, uh, across political groups, Maria, Irena, many others, you have been and are a force of reform in this country that is exceptional by European standards. And you know that I think that with my heart. And I really enjoy working with you. And also traveling in the countries over the years, I met amazing women everywhere uh, struggling and bringing this country forward. I'm happy to see there are also men in this room because actually gender equality, equal opportunities for men and women, equal rights for men and women, is a man issue. It's not a women issue. It's the whole society issue because we're not asking anyone a favor. We have our place and we should take it, not ask for it. 
Let me say Slava Ukraina loud and clear. Slava Ukraina. The first thing I would like to say here, all my love, solidarity, support from me, many colleagues, the European Parliament united with a strong majority, together with the other European institutions, unfortunately not all united, against the annexation, occupation and aggression. We are doing everything we can in the European Parliament to give you our support. Some of us have been writing to ask for additional sanctions, personal sanctions for those that have been involved in the latest uh, aggression in the Kerk Strait. We are working to try to get the member states to be united, because unfortunately they are not. And we are doing everything we can to support the process of the association agreement with all the soft powers that the European Union has to offer to help you to build a country you want to have a strong democracy, strong democratic institutions, and of course, free and fair elections together with our friend of the OEC in the election that is coming up now. Then I would like to say, yes, I am actually blacklisted by the Kremlin, proud to be. There is something that, uh, that, <laughs> there is something that strikes me when it gets to gender equality and equality between men and women. In the European Union, with Trump, with Putin, we see that where you have extreme right, populist, ideology, going to power or have influence on power, it affects directly women's rights. Extremism go together with sexism. In Russia, the Duma has decriminalized domestic violence which means that it's a crime only if you beat your wife or partner and, and really she has to go to the hospital with a broken leg, otherwise it's not violence. It's okay. You were mentioning Trump, who has reinstated the global gag rule, which means that girls and women all over the world lost from one day to the other vital support for their health, sexual and reproductive rights and health, which in many countries in the world makes the difference between life and death. I am very proud that together, definitely with France, I have a great cooperation with your great minister for gender equality and uh, equal opportunities. We have together with the European Union and some of the member states compensated and make sure that these projects could continue. We are working very closely also with Ukraine, of course, and I am proud to be with you, Maria, in the tandem and a dog tandem on violence against women. Let me say a word on violence against women before I, I answer to your question, because that's the crunch of gender equality. We cannot have equal opportunities as long as women are beaten up at home. Can you agree with that? As long as women are discriminated and harassed at work, as long as girls don't get education because they are forced to be married and have early pregnancies or are genitally mutilated. And definitely, since I served, as you know, in the wars in the Balkans, the siege of Sarajevo, in the war in Croatia for many years, I have a special sensitivity and, and uh, solidarity for the women and girls that are victims of the war here in Ukraine. And we see that there is more domestic violence, that there is more rape as instrument of war also here, and that's totally unacceptable in our time in our Europe. And I really hope that we can together do much more on that. So what is the best way to combat violence against women? It is the Istanbul Convention. Let's get the elephant out of this room. It is violence that is disrupting families, that is disrupting traditions, that is disrupting Christian values, not the Istanbul Convention. I feel, of course, humbled to talk about it in front of prominent representatives of the Council of Europe, but in my small way, I have been the spokesperson or the rapporteur or the negotiator, whatever you want to call it, in the European Parliament for the work on the Istanbul Convention. And we have achieved to have all the member states to sign in June 2017 for the accession of the European Union to the Istanbul Convention. We got Germany, Cyprus, Estonia and Croatia a Catholic country to ratify the Istanbul Convention. And I really hope 
that, Croatia, that Ukraine will do it as well. Why? Because it's gender ideology against women's rights. Gender ideology is fake news. Fake news. It is Putin behind it. Do you understand that? Not ratifying the Istanbul Convention means not advancing the basic of gender equality in Ukraine and pleasing Putin. I hope that everyone in the Rada understands that. And I would like to, to really give my all my congratulations and support because I know that the President of Ukraine, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, members of the government, prominent members of the Rada are really trying to bring it forward. But it's been more or less blocked now for two years. And I really hope that there will be enough political leadership in the Rada to bring it back to the agenda as long as it takes before the end of this mandate. It is also important in the relation with the European Union. It is part of our partnership and our dialogue. It is part of the association agreement and the, the human rights dialogue. Then I'm, this issue of gender ideology, we have it also in the European Union, of course. What is it about? Over these years, I've been working on, on preventing, combating, violence against women, domestic violence, protecting the victim, bringing the prosecutors to court and get justice, breaking women's silence, breaking girls' silence, breaking the isolations, moving the guilty from the women victim to the men perpetrators, and of course changing society, culture, and bringing a culture of respect. All of this is the Istanbul Convention. The definition of gender, according to the Council of Europe, is very simple. It is violence against women committed to a woman because she is a woman. It has nothing to do with LGBTIs, same-sex marriage. All of this is absolutely nothing to do with it. It's not small me saying it. It's the Council of Europe who owns the convention who says it. We had legal advice after legal advice, meeting after meeting at the highest possible level. Whoever wants to see the world gender of anything else than violence against women committed to a woman because she's a woman is a friend of Putin. That's what it is. In Ukraine, is a friend of Putin. I will, with all my heart, together with my colleagues, continue to be engaged and committed and remain available to work with all of you, of course, with our friends from the Council of Europe, with the rest of European institutions, in all the possible ways to continue to advance the agenda of violence against women, prevention, combating, and, and protecting victims. We are also working very much on the anti-trafficking legislation. I've been responsible in the European Parliament for implementing a very historical legislation on trafficking, which is also violent against women, affecting many women in, in Ukraine. The legislation, the protection of victims, the legislation on protection order, and so on and so forth. But please, put it on, make your voice heard to put it on the agenda here in the Rada. And the last thing I would like to say, since you mentioned that I'm elected in Sweden, I'm very proud to be elected in one of the countries where there is a, a really an entire society that believes that gender equality, women's rights, equal opportunities are human rights. And there is no culture, tradition, or religion that can motivate or justify to block or sabotage or, or slow down the gender equality agenda. And I, I can say more in the rest of the debate if you want on the other aspects, but I thought for me violence is the key and I think we all have to join forces on it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Anna Maria. Anna Maria, our uh, favorite uh, deputy of Europe Parliament, the, the uh, lady who is just, you know, promoting the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. I would like to come back to the educational issue. Mrs. Lilia uh, Rinevich, Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine. <clears throat> so thank you.
Mrs. Lillian, no, I would like to uh, um, say a few words about the video. So, well, in the video, we found that uh, on the equality of uh, genders, genders equality. So, well, Ukraine is on the um, uh, uh, normal level, uh, just you know, quite acceptable level. So, well, Ukraine, the Ukrainian women, they are, are not so uh, active in these so-called STEM specialities, mathematics, technologies, etc. So, we understand so well. It's very influential for the ability to work for, for the future, etc. So, well, uh, do you think, uh, is it possible to change the program on gender equality? But uh, this program was proposed to the Cabinet of Ministers. Uh, is it the uh, um, process uh, to faster this process to promote the gender equality in the sphere of uh, um, education? So, well, is it possible to um, make it faster? What about the index of equality, gender equality, and the efficiency of our policy in the fields of equality? So thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Len. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that it's so nice to be here and uh, to be in this uh, discussion, to participate uh, in this discussion together with this so uh, wonderful women and this uh, wonderful person, man, uh, vice uh, minister, so well, and they are not so pathetic to talk and no rhetoric uh, to provide the issue of gender equality. Those people who are really active and to make the real steps to provide the women to have the access to the uh, process of self-realization and what is the goal or the target or task of our education? What is the um, task for us for our education. So on this uh, uh, period after the revolution of dignity, the one of the main task is just to to uh, train the people to understand how to respect the dignity, uh, self-dignity, and the dignity of another person. So well, uh, this is the specific process of breaking through the different stereotypes. That's the art of relationship. That's the development of uh, self-development. And that this is the process of uh, self sureness So will you understand the Ukrainian context and post-Soviet context? And we are developing in this uh, uh, conditions and the uh, preamble of Mrs. Olena was about the uh, conditions. So, well, there was not approved the gender strategy for the education on the level of cabinet of ministers yet. That's why, because there was a kind of a resistance from the part of the parliament of Ukraine who are parliamentaries, uh, those who are representatives of the citizens of Ukraine. So, will it certify? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, through the education, it proves that through the education, through the young generations, we have to break through these stereotypes. I would like to give you more statistics information. Among them, all that uh, are graduates, those who are um, um, those are pretenders, those who are just uh, becoming the students, so about 79% are girls. Among those uh, abiturians, those who are just, you know, entering the technical institutions, 23 on all the girls. And for architectural specialities, for architecture, architecture is also a combination of art and engineering, too. So only one third of girls are trying to enter to this very institute. This is what you've shared about that. So where's the source? What is the reason for it? So let's analyze. So just you know, we can uh, uh, visit the school and open the old-fashioned uh, uh, manuals because since 2016 we started to deal with the anti-discrimination expertise. And I would like to say, and when we were talking about the representatives of the different specialities, well, <coughs> the role of uh, uh, of professions among the men uh, and the um, just like the information about the professions uh, were mainly focused on men, especially 90%, for example, were dealing with the so-called uh, very specific men's profession with the great, uh, uh, for example, um, men's power, etc. So 70% of them men. So mainly women they were accepted as the housewives. So well, 
you know, this is kind of influence for the psychology patterns for the kids. They can see these patterns from the early age. And after that, they are facing the reality. And they have say, and they've seen that there is no instruments, no tools, no not enough finances to improve prove it to influence on the political decision. So well, you have no enough uh, things to go to the uh, specific election campaign. You don't have any possible, uh, uh, any um, support to, or support to just, you know, enter the board of a uh, company, a board of directors of the company. And then that's, you know, that's, uh, there is a not uh, uh, quite sure of to uh, think that they can do it. And then for me, it was very pleasant to hear the story about the doctor, that the doctor made the decision that the main idea is the defense of the country and the joining to an alliance. And then doctor, the deputy, decided to choose this very committee, but not the committee of, for health care. This is the choice. That's a power. That's a will. That's the, the feelings of freedom. And I'm absolutely sure that the women could uh, bring a lot for our country during the process of decision making. And they will bring more and very important, very important uh, reformation uh, decisions and steps. And for this, uh, I would like to say a few more. Let's talk about the education. I would like to uh, surprise you that this year, first, firstly, in the history of Ukraine, we started on the base of Kiev's university named after Tara Shevchenko. We started the magister's program on gender studies. The first time in the history of Ukraine, master's degree in gender. So well, by the way, uh, it was done together with a partnership with the university from Sweden. So now that the universities of Ukraine, we created the all Ukrainian network of the centers of gender uh, education. And now when well, we are analyzing our manuals, but the third of the manuals, they are um, quite nice. We have uh, so well during the anti-discrimination expertise. We would like to say that a third of that manuals are quite okay. So well, and we cannot operate the so-called the average students' uh, uh, understanding. So well, we do have the term she student and his student so well from the uh, September of 2018 so well we started the principle for the labor education and the labor education is also dealing in the groups but it's uh, the mixed groups uh, so well, we do have this so-called basic course and the rest is under the choice of the students what the student would like to do now we are thinking of uh, um, the idea how to create this mixed groups of students uh, and to um, uh, deal with it during the process of uh, military uh, lessons because you know the first aid it would be the very important things for men for boys and then for uh, girls so also it would be nice to know how to uh, deal with the military um, arms and then, then we have to think this uh, gender strains how to deal with it so well it's very complicated work. Now, I want to say one thing, very pedagogical thing from my side. Psychologists, they say that when you're talking to your kids that it should be done like this or it should be done like this way, they, the kids, they can hear it and they can accept about 10% of what you're talking to them, especially if you're repeatedly talking to them with some advices. What is your own behavior? It's your model of your family relationship. That's a very influential fact for them. That's very important if the woman have the right um, um, attitudes to the limitation of the possibilities and how to use the specific reasons, how to make the choice, how to make a decision. So well, it's very important, these models and the influence from them to the kids. And we will do it. And I would like to share one, one news. So we, this week, we were 
uh, uh, choosing the best agency to provide the quality of the higher education. The criteria were so high, and the criteria were extremely high for that uh, uh, people. So there was the academic honesty and the experiences. They just experience with work uh, uh, and uh, the work with the foreign universities. No would like to say the results of that elections uh, among the 116 uh, uh, pretenders. So, well, we have 12 men and 10 men, uh, women among them, among that pretenders. Now, I want to say that among that pretenders, the very lowest criteria, we had the princess of gender equality. And we promise that we will follow the principles of gender equality during the process of choosing the gender balance. We didn't reach this, but at least we found it. And we found it because of uh, that uh, number, a great number of very talented and very hardworking women. And my dream is that our kids would live in Ukraine and would work in Ukraine when in Ukrainian parliament we will have at least more than one third of women who are members of parliament. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lilia. So you see that uh, we are holding this type of forums just to get the so-called uh, the news from the first uh, phase. And I would like to give the uh, floor to Karolina Leakovic, acting leader of uh, SDP Croatia Women's Women and Vice President of PES Women, Mrs. Karolina, could you tell us, we know that your party, what your car, country has the uh, woman president and based on your experience, what is the obstacle for the women to uh, uh, create the careers in political uh, activity? What is the very active instruments to support the women to be absolutely sure uh, and to uh, be very active in political life? Uh, and then please tell your uh, personal experience. Thank you in advance. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm so glad to be here in Kiev again, because I was here for the first Ukrainian Women's Congress last year. And I was here very uh, uh, in, in November as well, um, having uh, taking part in the Party Innovation Hub. So I met a lot of uh, women who are also here in the, in the audience, and I had um, such a positive wave of energy uh, and commitment from uh, uh, women from political parties. It was a cross-party event, and we have uh, tried to especially address the issue that um, also I was addressed here. But uh, also the, uh, the issue of political participation of women and political advancement of women, and actually breaking those, that glass ceiling that uh, we face uh, not only in Ukraine, but also in many other countries and in, in post-socialist uh, European part of the world as well. So uh, it's true that in Croatia since uh, 2015, we have a uh, first woman president of the Republic, but we also had a prime minister the first uh, woman prime minister back in 2009. And actually, they both come from the EPP uh, member party, so Anna Maria, Anna Maria's uh, uh, political family. Uh, and I am uh, somehow in the other, on the other side of the political spectrum. But I can only tell you that uh, both uh, colleagues that uh, uh, the, the former prime minister, Jadon Kokosor, and the current uh, president of the republic, Kolinda grabar Kitarovic, have actually made a great influence and have made significant changes in how uh, women are perceived in uh, political life, not only in Croatia, but also uh, in the region. And I can tell you that, um, well, let's say a week ago, there was a debate um, among a couple of um, politicians in Croatia regarding the uh, for forthcoming uh, elections for the president and that, that they will be held at the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020. So we know that the current president is going to seek another mandate, but we also have some other candidates from other political um, uh, parties. And one of the politicians, and it was a female leader of one of the liberal parties in Croatia, when asked who would you like to see as the candidate of the progressive spectrum of um, political parties in Croatia against Mrs. Grabar Kitarovic, who is obviously to be, uh, his, she's likely to be the candidate of the uh, EPP party. 
Uh, the lady said, well, I don't want another woman to be a candidate. I don't want two women to be candidates for the position of the president because there is uh, a danger that the political debate will only be around eyelashes, around clothes, and around hairdress. And I think that is something that we should all avoid, regardless of from which political party uh, were uh, kind of um, uh, coming from or representing. I would like to see as many women uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, going into political battle or fighting for political office uh, as possible from all uh, parts of the political spectrum. Um, we always tend to say that there is not enough women's solidarity. And I wouldn't say that it's about women's solidarity or men's solidarity. I would say that it's about not enough places for, or opportunities for women. If we had 50% of men and 50% of women like reserved places on the list, and actually that's what my party now has since uh, our last Congress six uh, months ago, then we wouldn't see that many uh, fights between um, women for only 25, 30% quota. So I think that um, quota is very much necessary for women entering uh, political parties or political life. But then it's not something that should persist. I think the parity in politics, 50-50, is something that we should all strive for. And actually, um, political will and uh, the way our political parties are designed is essential to this. So since political parties are uh, the core of political life. We all enter political life via political parties and they compete in the elections. I think uh, one of the goals for progressive um, uh, politicians, be them female or male, is to actually restore trust in political parties and the way that political parties operate, be it uh, transparency, be it democracy within political parties, and the way how you can actually, as a member of political party, advance in political life. So of course there are many obstacles to women entering um, any kind of actually uh, public life, be it uh, through um, civil society organizations, be it via political parties, but also be it in um, some other sectors of public life, like uh, also corporate uh, or uh, uh, other sort of expert organizations. We don't see that many women uh, actually advancing on that ladder. And I think one of the most uh, significant obstacles to that is economic and social uh, inequalities that we face in, in our countries. And we see that in some uh, parts of Europe, we see that uh, it has become uh, really an issue that the governments are not able to deal with. Um, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, we have seen the wave of populist uh, parties and the wave of populist uh, way of dealing with um, these inequality issues, which is not actually sustainable. They might be um, kind of appealing to, uh, to the public or to the electorate, but actually when they gain uh, trust or when they kind of uh, win the elections, we see that actually those promises they made are not sustainable and are not uh, feasible actually. And what uh, Anna Maria has rightly said, it's when you have the populists and right extremists um, their uh, policies and their strategies are actually built on retraditionalization or regression of women's rights and uh, women's role uh, in politics and in public life. It's not our tradition to have women at home, to have this, uh, uh, there is a German expression for that, um, Kinder, Küche, Kirche, so three K, it's like women are not uh, here only to um, uh, take care of um, families, of children, of uh, uh, domestic uh, kind of uh, life. I think it's, it's also because many of um, our uh, governments or many of our policies, be it economic and social policies, are now designed um, in, a, in a sense that the government or the public um, 
uh, services are not uh, that advanced anymore or are not that uh, spread uh, around anymore. So many of those now privatized or uh, non-existent public services, be it kindergartens, be it uh, elderly care, are also um, kind of designed for uh, women to, to uh, uh, take care uh, of the elderly and of the uh, kindergarten. So it's also, uh, uh, I think, a matter of the decentralization that uh, the minister has been talking about. So it's how to actually empower the local level, how to empower our local communities and to give them more uh, financial but also other resources so that they uh, can take care of the uh, everyday, let's say, everyday life of, uh, of women so that women can actually advance in their uh, economic um, uh, uh, life and in their involvement in politics as well. And we know that not many women actually uh, can join political, I mean, they can, we can join political parties, but it's actually the way that political life is organized that women are not able to participate in it. We know that in our political parties, we have uh, our meetings uh, in the evenings or after 6 p.m. And we know that uh, women uh, usually tend to um, deal with children or tend to deal with domestic uh, unpaid care work, as, as it is uh, called, in the evenings. And they cannot actually devote their time to participate in uh, different political party activities. So I think that uh, one of the first um, answers to the question of how we can break this glass ceiling and how can women become more uh, uh, present in political life is to feminize our political parties. Uh, in terms of, yes, bring more women into it, but also how to actually change the way our political uh, parties function. And I would always argue for a type of a feminine leadership in politics and in economy as well. And it's not only reserved for women, of course, there are also around the world, and we know of the um, examples of men who actually practice this type of feminine leadership, which means inclusive leadership, which means getting many different voices heard around the table, something as what we've heard uh, or what we've seen in this uh, panel. We have so many different uh, experiences brought together and so many different points of view, but what unites us is actually the idea that women and men should contribute uh, in, on equal terms, on equal footing to the development of um, our societies. Since we, in Ukraine and Croatia, we share not only the geographical kind of uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, parts of, uh, of Europe, but also uh, kind of um, uh, historical backgrounds. I, I'll just go back to the 1990, I was 13 years old then, and the war broke in, uh, in former Yugoslavia, and I was, I was a teenager, obviously, I was, I was still a kid. And I remember and I see how the, the country has gone through the war, aggression, and how we have been able to restore the, um, the institutions of the country, actually, and how women, especially from the non-governmental sector, but also from the government, then have been able to participate in the reconciliation and in the peaceful reconciliation of the country after uh, the war finished. And I think it's very important to bring women at the table of negotiations, of building bridges, and of building the institutions uh, uh, on your way to the uh, European Union. And I think the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 is crucial. And when we started our way, um, our path to independence, uh, of course we didn't have this resolution, but all the uh, Balkan countries and that still are in a very fragile uh, uh, situation, some of them, but uh, dedicated to the uh, EU and NATO membership hold to this 1325 resolution very much. So I would encourage the Ukrainian government and the uh, non-governmental uh, women's feminist organizations here to take a closer look at how the Balkan women have been getting together during the conflicts, after the conflicts. I think we can share the idea of uh, a necessity of peace 
as a precondition for the development of the country. Дякую, пані Кароліна. Дякую вам за Thank you so much, Mrs. Carolita. Thank you for your words and your recommendations. So, well, unfortunately, we have 10 minutes left. To, I would like to uh, give a floor to Mrs. Valerie Formuncian, the member of Parliament of France, chair of France-Ukraine Friendship Group. And uh, she's uh, 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 also from Macron's party. So, well, could you say a few words uh, about your impressions of our platforms today? Maybe you would provide some ex uh, specific encouragement, uh, for encouragement for us. Thank you so much. Excellent. Шановні пані та панове, спочатку я хотіла б uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to expect, especially thanks to my colleagues from Verkhovna Rada, from Parliament, and to thanks to Parliamentary Committee Equal Possibilities for being invited to um, have a, a present brief speech before you. So I am paying a lot of attention to the gender issues and the gender equality between men and women in our societies. And uh, it's extremely important issue for France and for all European Union. And I'm very glad to uh, see that uh, my motherland Ukraine is so actively joining to this uh, issues to promote uh, for publicity. I'm not a pessimist, but uh, today's reality, current reality, shows us that we do have a lot of things to do, a lot of years just to reach the real equality. And so that is why we decided to choose the Gender Equality Project as a priority for work uh, for us for this uh, years. And I found that this is the main point of our international activities. Um, and for us, it's uh, very important to protect the equality and to develop the international solidarity. These are universal uh, um, values uh, which uh, France supports. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Valeria. Thank you. Would you like to add something? So the legislation is very important, but what is more important is the change in mentality. And and it should be realized, and uh, it, uh, except only legislation initiatives, we launched a campaign on on awareness uh, uh, for social networks and on TV channels. These so social awareness is very important and we want our society to open the eyes and to become the society of the extremely high attention for equality. Thank you so much. Thank you so much that you so used your fantastic Ukrainian language. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, two questions and then after that we will have a non-stop platform on the safety of uh, uh, information space. So if you have two questions, please raise up your hands and uh, do you have the microphone, please? So well, and what would you ask? Uh, could you represent yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Irina Ayarov. I'm the deputy of Vajitomir's uh, uh, council and the, the head of the equal uh, uh, possibilities. I'm the lobbyist of the uh, heart of uh, equality in the local uh, societies and communities. And I would like to express special thanks to all of you, dear speakers, uh, and especially for your role in the gender uh, issues, because it's it's not the mainstream, uh, but it's going to be, and, and it's uh, the very interesting issue, uh, very global ideas for the society. We do have um, um, the uh, questions, and then it should be correlated with the budget code. And when we're just talking about the gender budgeting, so is it, uh, <coughs> um, uh, it would be interesting to know when it will be the changes into the uh, issue. So also we would like to 
We have one, one, uh, one uh, question, please. One, it should be correlated with our action plan because we don't have uh, uh, tools enough. Uh, we're just dealing with this uh, uh, tools uh, bottom up. At least we want uh, to improve the situation. If we're talking about Zhitomirs, then maybe Ms. Gennady will answer and then Ms. Serena will add. I would like to provide you the answer. So for me, it's very important to uh, uh, mm, uh, tell you that uh, the year uh, 2020 it will be the local election. We were talking about the change of the budget code, so we have to understand that someone should be involved into this uh, process. So well, whether we are so active in this normative act uh, uh, presentations or whatever, whether we are not involved into this uh, uh, projects, etc. So well, we have to understand that the level is uh, so low. Only 14% of our deputies. So well, we cannot make the so-called decision uh, or managerial decision. This cadency of the parliament should make the step to change this, uh, um, uh, you know, legislation ideas. Uh, and now we have to cover our uh, communities' ideas and approaches. We have to uh, use the new approaches to this uh, legislations on uh, um, uh, voting, and uh, we have to uh, provide this new regional project. So please join us, and we will continue to deal with it. We're just working with the Sweden of uh, Sweden uh, uh, government. So we'll thank you so much, but for us to be present on the level of the so-called high-level decision, it's very important to realize this above-mentioned project. So, well, Irina, thank you from behalf of the Parliament. I'm absolutely sure that the equal uh, um, um, opportunity is very important. So I am uh, dealing with this very issue. So I think I will b uh, b take the responsibility to deal with the gender quota for the elections uh, for Verkhovna Rada for the parliament. So well, please let us remember this very day. So well, I'm not the pessimist, I'm the realist. And uh, I don't think we would be successful and this uh, election code and this variant that we are proposing where we have the 4,000 uh, different annexes. And so, but I'm absolutely sure that it should be the especially specific changes, uh, especially for the punishment for the um, violations of the gender codes and falsification. So, well, the second is, well, why we don't have any gender uh, budgeting still uh, on the go. Well, it's a kind of a closed zone, so well, not uh, uh, we have we have to break through this discrimination in the parliament, and it's also a very important task for us. And I think that Mrs. Weizhovska Svetlana, our colleague, uh, she's very active in this uh, gender budgeting issue and quoting gender of the for budget. So well, she will promote in this very issue because the next budget should be approved with the specific notes regarding the equality and the gender content should be very important uh, in this uh, very issue. And I want to support the position of our guests that populists and extremists, they are very radically, uh, radically uh, uh, things, and uh, especially in the context of blocking of any European values. And in me, I think that our parliament should take these responsibilities on ratification the Stockholm Convention, but the obstacles are not only radicals or populists, but also some other so-called ours, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, those who are really too far from uh, using these values. But for us, uh, it should be ratification of Stambul's Convention. It's very much to think. And, and uh, finally, I would like to say, well, despite of all that laws on the go, we have to change the mentality. And uh, we have to have this respect, gender equality, to become the ideology and the main principles for both women and men, those who are in the policy 
and at least we have four women. They just proclaimed that they are becoming the candidate for the president. But uh, frankly speaking, none of the, not so many of them are, you know, uh, really following the principles. But at least we will do our best to talk to that candidates uh, and to remind that uh, the main slogan should be the equality and the idea of respect, and it should be the main ideology, as our French guest already mentioned so well. Uh, women are still uh, scared to become the politicians because of the sexisms, because of the discrimination, which somehow happens, but I want to say that so I also pass through the psychological trauma because of the gender, please do not be scared because none of uh, um, uh, um, try to abuse you because the abuse is uh, the abuse of those person who is just abusers all. And I want to add one more word from Russ and then we're closing this session. It's uh, based on fair competition. Uh, political parties, fair, democratic, uh, and based on uh, ideologies maybe, or different views in different spectrum of political system is very important, is, is fundament for political system and uh, for good governance. Without that, without strong, responsible political parties would not be good governance, would not be um, even gender equality, I would say. In my party, I am center-right, EPP group, represent EPP um, family in European Union, Homeland Union, the name of my party, Lithuanian Christian Democrats. We never had any quotas, but last election, we had in first 10 positions on our list, five women, five men. And it was selected not by chairman of the party, it was selected by people because l the list was composed, was, it was voting in the party. About uh, 10,000 members of my party, they voted and five women, five men, it was not because of quotas, but because people, they don't think that women or men are good or bad because they are men or women. We had recently new step forward. We had open primaries for candidate to select our candidate for presidential election. We will have next year. And women candidate got 80% of open, in open voting together, members of party or registered non-members of party. And, the men, and men only 20%. And it, not, it, is not, it was not about men or women. It was fair competition of ideas and fair competition of, uh, of understanding of the future of the country. So democracy based on uh, understanding of uh, values and very democratic political parties, not based on money, not based on personalities, but based on people they are they selected these political parties is the future of good govern governance and, of course, discussion on men or women inside the political parties. We need to finish our panel session because the next one uh, platform in terms of security and information field uh, is very important and we have a very long day. Uh, let's take a photo for our memory. Thank you everybody for your attention and we started nicely. Thank you, Mrs. Elena Kondratyuk. Thank you for all speakers. So, all the uh, guests, we will kindly ask you to stay at your places. In a few minutes, we're going to start the next platform. Питаю вашу увагу на праву сторону залу. Цінні ідеї, які звучали і звучатимуть сьогодні під час дискусійних платформ, ловлять і фіксують у вигляді візуального конспекту. Цей формат називається скрайбінг. Любі гості, просимо вас не розходитися. У нас абсолютно невеличка перерва. Ми розпочинаємо за 2-3 хвилини.